शुक्लांबरधर विष्णु शशिवर्ण चतुर्भुज प्रसन्न वदन ध्यात सर्वघ्नोपात श्रीराघव दशरथात्मज प्रमेय सीतापति रघुकुलान्वयरत्नदीप निशाचर विनाशक नमा निशाचर विनाशक नमा राय राम भद्राय रामचंद्राय वेधसे रघुनाथाय नाथाय सीताय पत नम पूजत राम रामे मधुर मधुराक्षर आरुह्य कविता शाखा वंदे वाल्मीकिकोकिल गोष्पदीकृतवाराशि मशकीकृतराक्षस राण महामालात्न वंदे अनिलाज सीतारामगुणग्राम पुण्यारण्य विहारिण वंदे विशुद्ध विज्ञान हरीश्वर कपीश्वर कवीश्वर कपीश्वर ओम अवर सैल्यूटेशन आर टू राम द एम्बॉडिमेंट ऑफ राइटियसनेस our salutations to the mighty warrior hanuman and to the great sage valmiki who has given us this nectar of ramayana may the sacred words of valmiki resonate in our minds and hearts and bring us wisdom peace and happiness om dear friends from today we will try to read valmiki's ramayana i deem it a great privilege that i am able to say this valmiki ramayana here on this advaita academy website i also consider it as a very great divine grace and also the grace of my gurus that i am able to read out these shlokas in front of you and i am trying to explain this valmiki ramayana this valmiki ramayana of course i will not be able to read all the 24000 shlokas because this valmiki ramayana He is a book which is having six parts, six can, six kanda. It is called each part is called a kanda. So this Valmiki Ramayana is a fairly huge book having about twenty four thousand verses. So all the twenty four thousand verses we will not be able to read. What I propose to do is to read out only the very first chapter in the very first book. The first book is called Bala Kanda. Bala, you know, Bala means a boy. when rama lakshmana bharata shatrughna all these were children how they grew up etc etc so and then how they till they go to the forest and all those things and till the marriage of rama rama to so, till that time this uh, balakanda covers so we i will read out only the first chapter because this first chapter is a conversation between a great sage called valmiki and another divine sage called narada so this is there is a discussion between two great sages and then this story ramayana story in brief has been told by narada to valmiki in this first chapter so narada happens to meet we do not know how he met narada meets uh, sorry valmiki meets narada and he asks him a question today in this world who is a highly virtuous man of course we are going to read out all those uh, verses and i am going to explain all those verses who is a great highly virtuous man i want to know who is the strongest who is the most valorous who is the most wise 
So all the great qualities, all the divine qualities which we can visualize in a person, all those qualities he, he enumerates. Then Narada, he thinks for a moment and then he says, yes, there is one such person called Rama. And then he narrates the story of Rama, Rama very briefly. And then that is the summary, the sum and substance, the summary of the whole Ramayana. In brief, Narada tells Valmiki. So that is the first chapter. So I am going to read this first chapter shloka by shloka. Because this is this first chapter is called Bala Ramayanam. So the first book is called Bala Kandam. The first book of, out of the six books, the first book is called Bala Kandam. And in, in that Bala Kanda, the very first chapter is called Bala Ramayanam. In fact, why is it called Bala Ramayanam? Because it was taught to all the children in olden days. Why olden days? Even when I was young, even now it is being taught. In some traditional families, they do teach their children this Bala Ramayanam. That book is very much available, a small book if you go to a bookstall. A very small book of this size, will be slim, slimmer than this, will be available, Bala Ramayanam, which is learned by heart by all the kids. In fact, I learned it when I was... My grandfather taught me this Valme, this Balaramayana, and I learnt it by heart at that time. But I never knew the meaning. <laughs> so later, only over a period of time, then when I started learning some Sanskrit and all that, then only I came to know, and I was fortunate enough to have a book written by one very eminent scholar called Pullela Sri Ramachandrudu. He has written a word-to-word, -word, uh, say, translation, a word-to-word, word-to-word tra translation of this whole Ramayana. And then he has given the meaning of each and every verse. So that is how, with the help of that book, I could read it very, very, uh, say, comfortably. And in addition to that, there are very famous, uh, say, commentaries on this. Because a poet is a person who creates a great work of art. And then the audience may or may not be able to understand. Moreover, we are so distanced in time. Ramayana was spoken long, long, long ago. We do not know when Valmiki composed this Ramayana. Tradition says that it happened many thousands of years ago. But of course, modern scholars may or may not believe in that. But tradition says that several thousand years ago, this Ramayana uh, say was composed. And in the lifetime of Rama, that too. Because Valmiki is asking about a contemporary person. Konvasmin sampratam loke gunavan kasya viryavan. He says, who in this present day world, who is there, who is such a mighty, valorous person? Gunavan, a highly virtuous person. Viryavan, a valorous person, etc., etc., he asks. So it was a contemporaneous thing for Valmiki. And then we do not know at, at what time he wrote. And then now, distanced by so much of time, we are not able to, we do not know uh, say uh, the meaning of all the words because in the sense that uh, we are so cut off even from our, our tradition we are cut off from our own uh, Gita and Bhashya Gita or Upanishads etc. So it is necessary that somebody say explains these things and luckily there are several traditional scholars who have explained this very very many old scholars in fact these scholars are also uh, say they are several centuries um, say old so these commentaries are available I was also lucky to read two good commentaries. One is by one gentleman called Govinda Raja. It is actually a Vaishnava commentary. But anyway, we are not against <laughs> any Vaishnava or Shaiva or anybody. So that commentary is a beautiful commentary. Why? Yes, because Govinda Raja, he treats, of course, Lord Rama as the personification of Vishnu and uh, say the incarnation of Vishnu and very, very worshipful. We also worship Rama. So, Govinda Raja Vyakya is a very, very detailed Vyakya, wonderful Vyakya. And again, another Vyakya uh, from the Advaita perspective is given by Maheshwara Tirtha. That Vyakya is not so elaborate as Govinda Raja. Govinda Raja is, Vyakya is very, very elaborate. Maheshwara Tirtha is slightly smaller. So, I follow these two Vyakyas mostly. So, that is my, uh, say, what I propose to do. And then here, before going into the text, we have to know a little bit about what exactly is this text. So this, the very meaning of the word Ramayana, we have to see. Rama, Ayana, there are two words in that. Rama and Ayana, these two words combined, it becomes Ramayana. Ramayana means Rama's path, Rama's way of life, the way he uh, say, exemplified all the virtues. Because he was supposed to be, he was called actually Ramo Vigrahavan Dharmaha. Vigrahavan means it is as though 
the dharma is personified dharma means righteousness temporarily we will take that meaning uh, that word for that word dharma tentatively we will take that word as uh, to mean righteousness ramo vigrahavan dharma means he is the personification of dharma he is the personification of or the embodiment of righteousness and then how exactly he exemplified all the virtues so how he how did he lead his life so that is his path that is the ayanam that is what is called ramayana that is we are going to see how very various virtues are exemplified or actually demonstrated by rama in his day to, in his daily in his life so that is what we are going to see the meaning of ramayana is that then secondly we see that this is uh, probably the most popular work in the indian tradition the most popular text in the indian, indian tradition and as i said the children even before they are taught uh, say abc or a a e e in our own uh, tradition a a e is there in sanskrit it is there in all indian languages of course when you see you talk about english you talk about abc so even before the children are taught a a e then they are uh, told about some story of ramayana some hanuman how he just crosses over that uh, say uh, that ocean and then he reaches lanka and how he beats up all these uh, demons and what not so all those stories are told even to young kids so that is what we see it is so popular and then it is also called the adi kavya adi means the first one and kavya kavya means a great poetic work okay before that i also wanted to introduce this book the text which i am following is what is called valmiki ramayana this is in uh, two volumes this is actually this is volume 1 uh, say a similar uh, same a similar volume is there another volume also uh, this book contains the text with english translation there is a text here and then the english translation is there the commentary is not there of course there is no commentary there is no elaboration it gives a just a simple uh, say translation of the shloka so that is what this text is so i'll be just seeing this text and uh, reading it out and uh, so this is called what is called the adi kavya and it is also called what is called itihasa this is another word which we have to know itihasa itihasa is what is the meaning what, what does it mean iti ha asa it means it happened thus it happened it happened so, like this so it is it implies that it is some somewhat historical in nature so which means <coughs> that rama is a historical personality who existed several thousand years several thousand years ago we do not know when and then several ramayanas are also there in several traditions that also is there there is a jain ramayana there is a buddhist ramayana version of ramayana there are several versions of ramayana but the most popular version of ramayana is valmiki ramayana and then this is translated into all the indian languages there is no indian language into which it is not translated and there is no singer who has not sung say <laughs> songs about rama sita hanuman and all these people and this itihasa as i was saying itihasa it has got a special design this word itihasa uh, what is the design of that sage vyasa we know that uh, there is another sage called vyasa he has written that huge voluminous text called mahabharata so there in the very first chapter he writes one line itihasa purana abhyam vedam samupa brahmayet he says so by means of this itihasa and purana there are two types of books called itihasa and purana with these two uh, it, you can call it a genre in english we call it a, we call it a genre so itihasa is one genre purana is another genre with the help of these two let us elaborate the meaning of the veda let us popularize the meaning of the veda let us take the message of the veda to the common man because the vedas are slightly complicated texts they talk in uh, highly symbolic uh, say uh, words in a very a very cryptic symbolic manner and, and then a lot of commentary elaborate commentary is needed on them so the message of the gita the dharma the righteousness there are two dharmas which are told in the in vedas we know that is what is called the pravrutti dharma and another thing called nivrutti dharma pravrutti means how should a person conduct himself in his life in his day to day life what how how virtuously he has to lead his life and then while leading that virtuous life 
he has to purify his mind his his life should be in such a way that it purifies his mind it purifies his heart it purifies his behavior so with that purification he has to study the vedic texts and then only a person of with a purified mind with a pure mind can understand only he can realize the reality which is told in the upanishads or the gita etc so upanishads say for example you are brahman you are the reality so if you want to realize that if you are quarreling with your neighbor every day if you are if you are entertaining hatred and animosity against somebody if you are defining yourself in a small way and having hatred in your mind you can't see reality so this purification of mind is what is needed so you for example upanishad says raga dvesha have to be eradicated how can you eradicate raga dvesha raga dvesha means attachment for a thing and enmity for something else hatred for something else so such things they bind a man they limit a man so you have to go out of those things so if you have to go out of those things there is a character here called rama you study his character see what he has done on on this particular situation how he behaved how he conducted himself so if rama were to be in my position what would he do now so you think like that let 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 the mind become purified so that is what is the uh, so that is what is the strategy of these two genres called itihasa and purana itihasa there is a more historical content as i said itihasa this ramayana is called an itihasa and bharatam is called an itihasa we have got these two uh, huge enormous texts which are, which fall under the genre of itihasa purana there are several works there are several books which are which fall under the category of purana they may there may be some historical characters there for example the stories of certain kings so they may be historical characters but mostly it deals with uh, say the gods goddesses and then different uh, say traditions different traditions which we had in our uh, say in indian uh, society different traditions means somewhere the worship of ganesha is one tradition another place the worship of some other uh, say shakti is another tradition so for that you read devi purana in some other some other group they worship shiva so that is called shiva purana and several shiva um, say related puranas so like that they deal more with uh, the deities and then there is a lot of symbolism in that we have to understand the symbolism there <clears throat> so puranas on one hand they talk more about the symbolism uh, they, they talk in terms of symbolism they are more related to gods goddesses etc they also elaborate the meaning, meaning of the vedas only they are also meant for telling the meaning of uh, vedas to the common man this is this uh, itihasa takes some historical characters whereas purana uses the mythical characters or mythological characters or the deities you can say vina vinayaka or shiva or vishnu or any shakti any other thing so that is what is the general structure in english we call this ramayana and this and mahabharata as the epics you know the word epic in indian tradition we have only two epics that is ramayana and mahabharata mahabharata is more voluminous that is having 100000 verses i have no i don't know whether somebody has counted or not but they say that it is having 100000 verses ramayana of course it is very well counted 24000 verses so this 24000 verses are there it means it is roughly slightly smaller than 1/4 the size of mahabharata so what is the meaning of this epic epic generally in english also we find that the epics not in english uh, not for the english people but for the greek people they had uh, they had epics the english people never had any epics uh, the greeks they had for example iliad and odyssey homer homer's iliad and odyssey they had so these two they were supposed to be great works I, of course i have no idea about them but they are called epics the I, the epic the vision of an epic is very grand why is it called epic even certain films they are called oh it is an epic movie we say that epic movie means it is not the run of the mill uh, movie you where you just find some uh, stupid entertainment it deals with a greater theme broader uh, say human uh, perspective so it uh, deals with uh, the human problems in general in a, uh, in a more elaborate scale so that is what we see in an epic so that means uh, an epic is a, has a grander vision it has got a grand vision 
a cultural vision would let us say it has got a grand cultural vision for the whole society so that is how it uh, this book has particularly guided our society throughout the ages ramayana has guided us throughout the ages in the sense that if the uh, say if there is any situation a man would uh, just see uh, he he will quote from ramayana oh in this particular situation this is what is the dharma so it has guided the society our whole family structure our human relations they were all guided by ramayana and mahabharata of course now that we are talking about ramayana we'll talk about ramayana so the of course there there is more there is more is a, in mahabharata the emphasis is slightly different here the emphasis is on different values social values the relationship between human beings relationship between a father and a son what is the duty of a son towards his father what duty of a father towards his son duty of a son towards his mother then duty of a brother towards his brother duty of a master to his servant duty of a servant to his master if you are talking about hanuman and rama relationship then again uh, the relationship between husband and uh, wife rama and sita relationship between a brother and a brother so these are the things you find good brothers and bad brothers also there vali and sugriva you come across brothers who quarrel whereas you find uh, say rama and bharata where rama doesn't want the kingdom bharata doesn't want the kingdom they say you rule it you rule it <laughs> so you find that sort of relationship so all human relationships and also the relationship between the king and the subjects so all such uh, human relations uh, they are all uh, say explained in this particular uh, say epic and uh, if we if we see the indian family system the so called giant family even today some remnants are still there even it is not as though the, the giant family has so totally disappeared it is not as though the son is actually driving away his father <laughs> there are still lot many giant families and still lot of us why lot of us 99% of us are living with our wives only and uh, the uh, the marriage is long lasting long lasting means once you get married there is no uh, there is no divorce contemplated in hindu religion they it is this marriage is supposed to be a sacred bond it is a supposed to be a sacred bond for perpetuation of dharma for propagation of dharma so that is that is how it is conceived so the family values if we see they are there mostly because of this text only this epic only we are still continuing those uh, we are still having the uh, great moral values in society and then if you see ramayana is a, such a household name you go to every village any village in india any corner of india whether it is south or north or northeast or northwest anywhere even including northeast even if you go to northeast some tribal area if there are two brothers one brother will be ram and another brother will be lakhan ram lakhan so like that everywhere and you go to any village there is a small temple about a small temple for rama so this is how this ramayana is something which has penetrated the whole of india and then the rama's path if you you know the general story of ramayana rama's wife was abducted by ravana and then rama and uh, say uh, his brother they go they go in search and then uh, say the uh, the monkey armies they are all dispersed all over the country and then rama travels right from ayodhya right down to sri lanka and the whole path has been described and there are several people who have retraced the steps of rama there are several people historians and also generally people who are interested who have retraced the steps of rama and then who have seen all those places so it is something which there are so many historical places including the place in sri lanka where ravana ravana is supposed to have kept sita that ashoka vanam is also there so it has now become a tourism spot so all such things we see so this ramayana is something which is recited by uh, say all the uh, say musicians for example if you take uh, tyagaraja or any other whether not only in south india but even in the north tulsidas has composed ramayana which can also be sung tulsidas ramayana not only to be read to be sung also this ramayana also valmiki is going to say that it is meant to be sung and it was first sung by lava and kusha in the court of rama so that also we are going to see so this ramayana is something which is sung by everybody the highest poet down to the common uh, commonest even beggar because we find in village traditions many beggars come singing story singing songs about ramayana 
and uh, their beggars are not ordinary beggars they are also highly uh, say if not learned they are very talented people they compose songs just like that and then they sing songs uh, if you just see a family if you see a noble family they just compose a song on that so like that even even people who come for begging there are some some begging classes like that they sing ramayana so it is so popular in in india so this is what we see and we also see that this book was read by it is called it is for family reading actually so elderly people in the house used to sit even olden days even in my childhood there is what is called a vyasa peetham there is a wooden frame because the books are usually huge it is very difficult to, now right now i am having one uh, say uh, say some plastic frame but in olden days there used to be some wooden frame some x shaped wooden frame where they used to keep this book like this and then they used to read out some elderly man used to sit and read out while all the family members they used to sit around him and then they used to listen to him so it is a book for family reading so that is another thing which we see about this ramayana and then if we see the structure of this ramayana as i was saying there are six parts in this so they are the balakanda ayodhya kanda six parts of course we will see in course of time there is another say last part which is called uttara kanda where rama is said to have sent away his wife uh, say because there were some uh, say there was some loose talk among the people that okay oh this rama is um, a person who has not followed dharma you see his wife was abducted by one demon and it, uh, she was kept in their house for about an year or so and then rama has accepted uh, that lady how is it that he is virtuous so some sort of loose talk was there and then rama decides to send away his wife so that portion is called uttara kanda that uttara kanda people say that it is not composed by valmiki and even uh, for reading even while they do this ramayana saptaha there is a tradition called ramayana saptaha saptaha means a week saptaha saptaha means seven and aha means a day seven days we are supposed to read this ramayana of course there is a, there is a structure also first day from what uh, from which portion to which portion second day from this particular point to another point so there is a structure of reading this uh, ramayana so but then in that saptaha also this uttara kanda is not mentioned uttara kanda is not um, say read, read because there is a traditional belief that it is not something which is composed by valmiki and even the style is totally different here in ramayana the style is very very poetic there it is not so poetic it is not poetic and then the style itself is so totally different so very many scholars they agree that it is not by valmiki it is later composed by somebody else but that uttara kanda also is available uh, in the book stalls it is also there it is available so then it is also supposed to be a very very sacred work because as i said it is conveying the message of the vedas to the common man so that is the reason why it is called sacred another reason is here this character this rama is said to be an incarnation of lord vishnu an incarnation means the lord vishnu taking a human form that of course we we will see in course of time what is an incarnation the meaning of incarnation we will see in slightly greater detail and it is also a kavya a, a great poetic work as i said and what is it uh, what is it that distinguishes a poetry from an ordinary thing ordinary verse it is of course as i said it is also an itihasa it is also a great poetic work then what exactly it is is it an itihasa or a poetic work it is both it is an itihasa in the sense that it is conveying the message of the vedas to the common man it is a poetic work because it is not an ordinary versification which we see it is the message is conveyed in, in conveyed in such a beautiful pleasant way you see vedas convey the meaning can say tell something like a boss tells a subordinate that is why it is called prabhu samhita prabhu means lord prabhu samhita means like a lord telling his say subordinate you do like this satyam vada dharmanchara you do this you do this it says that is what is called veda then strictly speaking this itihasa and purana they speak like they give examples of various kings various other stories etc etc and then they speak like a friend suppose i am speaking to you 
I give some good advice to you. You see, this gentleman has done like this. This particular king did like this and then he suffered. Please do not do that. Please do not follow this wrong path. So like that, a friend to a friend. That is what is called Mitra Samhita. Poetry, on the other hand, it is somewhat like your lady love. With great love and affection, she comes to you and then she gives a kiss to you and then she says, Oh, why can't we do this? So maybe in a more gentler form, I am not able to say, convey that gentleness. So that is what is called Kanta Samhita. So that is why poetry is said to convey something in a very pleasant, very, say, delightful manner. So that is why it is called Kanta Samhita Taya Upadesha Yuje. Just as your lady love will give you some message in a very, very pleasant way and it is so uh, something which, is, which you very happily accept. So in such a manner, it uh, gives the message in such a beautiful way. So that is why it is a poetic work. And then poetic poetry also contains another thing. In the sense that uh, you read uh, Itihasa, suppose you read uh, some, uh, some story, let us say. Uh, in the, in a, just like some case, case diary, suppose there is, uh, you, go, you attend the court and then in that court uh, there is a case law, a particular case, okay, this gentleman has done like this, this gentleman has done, this is the allegation against him and the judge discusses fact by fact in a very, very factual way, fact after fact in a very, very dispassionate factual way and gives a judgment. And then if you read a judgment, you may get uh, educated, but then you will, you are not, you don't have that uh, happiness within you. Whereas, if you read a poetry, poetry, if you read a work of art, uh, there is an emotion. There are so many emotions which are portrayed here. Uh, that Those emotions are, are, are called rasa. Rasa means, the, strict, the actual meaning of rasa is a juice. That is, if you take a nice, uh, uh, say, very pleasant juice, it gives you happiness. Kavyam is also called Alochanamrutam. It is called a nectar. Kavyam is called Alochanamrutam. That is, you see the, you dwell on the words which the poet has chosen. Because in any poetic work, the poet chooses his diction in a beautiful way. He very appropriately, he chooses diction. Because the meaning which he has to convey, has to match with these words which he has chosen. There should be a perfect fusion between the words which he has chosen and the meaning which he is conveying. That fusion has to be there. So that is why, say in Raghuvamsha, we say, Rabhagartha viva sampruktav, this work and artha, the word and the meaning, they have to be so perfectly fused. So the poetic work is like that. And then, in such a poem, the more you deliberate on that mentally, the more you think about it, the more happiness it gives because you derive more and more meanings. So that is what that is why it is called Alochana Amrutam. There is a, there, a small distinction is made between a wonderful music, very delightful music, and a kavya or a poetic work. Music, as long as you hear, it is there, it temporarily totally pervades you and then it gives you happiness. Kavya, on the other hand, it also it gives happiness when you are reading. And then thereafter, even when you are contemplating on that, Kavyam Alochana Amrutam, the more you think on that, the more it gives. So that is the nectar. That nectar is called what is called Rasa. And in English, we can uh, say roughly translate it as emotion. And there are so many emotions which are there in any poetic work. For example, love, romance is an emotion. And then valor is another emotion. Humor is another sentiment or emotion which we see. And then similarly, something which is very grotesque and ugly, that is another thing. And uh, even there, the audience, they, they also want to see grotesque things. When they see grotesque things also, there is some element of, uh, say, uh, some uh, feeling of rasa, some enjoyment of rasa in, a, in the audience. So that is why that is also called rasa. And then compassion, you see some very, 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 very uh, pitiable situation. For example, in, in this Sita, who is there sitting in that Ashokavana, and then we, you feel really sad. So that sadness, and sadness also is a very great emotion, because as some English poet has said, there is one English poet called Shelley, he says, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. <laughs> so sadness is a great, great emotion, where you find some sweetest songs have come from sadness. So you find here in Aranyakanda, Rama cries. Rama, of course, he is a very valorous man and all that. 
when sita is abducted rama is he can't control his uh, agony and then he cries and when he cries out really if there are some people who put those shlokas to music they are really they are so moving they are so touching and uh, so moving so such things we see in uh, say in this kavya so that is why it is called ramayana is called both a kavya and also an itihasa so we have to see if you say that if somebody says no no is it an itihasa or a kavya we have to understand that it contains the uh, say um, components of both characteristics of both itihasa and also it say the kavya then if we come to the text let us come to the text if we come to the text we see that this is a dialogue this starts with a dialogue between two saintly people one is called valmiki the he is the questioner valmiki is the student let us say but tentatively let us say that valmiki is the student and narada is the teacher narada is another senior sage let us say so it is a dialogue between two saints or two sages and when two saints discuss what will what will they discuss they will discuss something in the interest of humanity in the interest of mankind if there is some ordinary students they will discuss some mathematics if you go to a pub they you will discuss which wine is better if you meet if you meet some other group they will be discussing their own subject but when two saints meet there is nothing personal for them there is no personal interest for them their their always their thinking is always about a humanity how to make the humanity better how to make human life better how to guide human life better so that will that will be their thinking so from that point of view the question arises only from that point of view so valmiki is the questioner and valmiki we have to know a little bit about the background of valmiki in sanskrit the meaning of valmika means a mound an other mound say for example snake mound we know snakes and then ant ant heap we know so that huge thing a mass of earth which uh, come uh, say piles up a mass of um, say dust and it becomes uh, say soil it piles up on something it is called mound snake mound of course we are very very familiar with the snake mound so valmiki is something to do with that valmika what is this valmika so there is a small story for that valmiki it seems in his earlier life he was a hunter not only a hunter but also a robber he was just there in the all the hunters used to be moving in the jungles and then going hunting about killing animals and then um, say looting people suppose some traveler who is there looting so it it once it seems that sage narada passed by narada is again a wonderful character we'll come to that sage narada passed by narada doesn't have anything except his uh, say uh, some veena narada has a musical instrument called veena and he is a divine uh, say sage he doesn't have anything um, except a loin cloth and then he is having that tambu this veena so this gentleman saw who this valmiki so he thought okay let me snatch this veena so he snatched that veena and then he okay then there was a small discussion between them how why do why do you snatch my veena i don't have anything so no no this veena of course i'll be able to dispose of to somebody i may get some money so why do you do all this is it not bad are you not doing a very 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 bad thing so then he said no how is it i have to uh, i i i have to take care of my family i have to take care of my followers etc etc then narada said okay you say that you are doing it for the sake of your people and while you are doing this robbery and all these sinful deeds you are acquiring a lot of sin you are acquiring a lot of uh, demerit sin is what we call papam papam is papa is suppose there is a sinful act if you do a sinful act you acquire some demerit which is going to reflect on the after life the next life the man will be born as a worm the man is born as a dog or something like that so in that manner so that is why it is called sin so are you not acquiring sin and you are acquiring this sin for the sake of all your family members all your family members they do not acquire any sin only you are acquiring this sin then this chap this hunter is earlier name there is some name for him uh, of course valmiki is also a historical character but we do not know the we the historic historicity of valmiki is not known the the valmiki seems to have replied no no my wife and children they will all share my sin okay 
I will be here only. Uh, you go and ask your wife and children. Then this chap thought, okay, let me ask my wife and children. Then he tied uh, says Narada to some tree so that Narada could not escape. And then he went home and then he asked his wife and children. He explained what exactly happened. Then they said, no, no, you. it is your duty to support us. How is it that we have to share your sin? So this gentleman, Valmiki, got shocked. <laughs> got shocked and then came back to him. And then he handed over his, uh, uh, say, of course, the th his uh, veena, it was, whether it was really snatched or not, we do not know in detail. So then he said, no, no, I am very sorry. And then what should I do? Okay, then while Narada sees, seems to have told him one mantra. People say that it is Rama, 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 Rama Japam. People say that it is Rama Japam. We do not know. He told something. You do meditate. You do meditate on this particular mantra. And Valmiki, all said and done, he was a man who is a tough character. He was a he was a hunter. He was a robber. Obviously, he was a tough character. Only problem was all the toughness was in one direction. So he turned that toughness in another direction, and then he meditated in the same tough manner. He meditated with the same amount of sincerity, same amount of toughness, same amount of determination. So when he sat on meditation, he sat for such a long, long, long time that a mound grew on him, an other mound grew on him. And later, of course, Sage Narada or say Brahma or somebody came and then they said, Oh, my dear boy, you wake up. And then he seems to have woken up from that Valmiki. Because we do not know anything, any historical facts about Valmiki. Of course, we have made Valmiki a legend. Uh, but then this story is very, very popular. This story is very popular. Valmiki, the very name has come from, uh, say, that uh, Valmika. His original name seems to be some Ratnakara or some such name. We do not know. So this Valmiki is a person who asked this question. And then uh, the first chapter, as I said, we'll see the first chapter now. The first chapter is a summary of the whole Ramayana and the first chapter is something which is told by Narada to this uh, Valmiki. <clears throat> and this Narada again, of course I will, uh, I can tell that small story also in, very, in a very, very brief manner. This Narada also is a historical character. But because we do not know about his uh, say times and uh, his real uh, his life, we have also made him a legend. We have also made him a divine uh, say, sage. And this Narada, you see there is a book called Narada Smruti. You know what is a Smruti? Smruti is somewhat like Manu Smruti, Parashara Smruti, Yajnavalke Smruti, Narada Smruti, like that. We have got several uh, codes of uh, several law texts. You can call it a law text. And uh, in our tradition, there is a, there is a uh, say convention that in Krita Yuga, that is long, long, long ago, several, several uh, say uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, the particular code followed was Manusmriti. Even now, we talk about Manusmriti and we attribute all wrong things to our uh, say system. But Manusmriti is not the thing which is not followed, which is something which is not, uh, which is, uh, Manusmriti is not a thing which is followed now. So Manusmriti was for that Krita Yuga. And then the next Yuga was called Treta Yuga, the Yuga relating to Rama. And then in that yuga relating to Rama, this Narada Smriti was supposed to be the, uh, say, um, defining feature at that time. Narada Smriti, Tretayam Narada Smriti, Dvapare Shankhali Kitav. The next, say, the next period was called Dvapara Yuga, that is Dvapara Yuga where Krishna and other stories we find. There, that is called Shankhali Kita Smriti, one Smriti, one code of uh, law um, uh, written by two brothers called Shankha and Likita. Kalau Parashara Smriti, we are now in Kali Yuga. In this Kali Yuga, we are supposed to follow, or rather this uh, dominant uh, Shruti is Parashara Shruti, uh, Smriti. So this is how there is a convention. So this Narada, in the name of Narada, there is a book called Narada Smriti. That Narada Smriti also is a text, a code of law. Then, uh, then there is another book called Narada Bhakti Sutra. Bhakti Sutra means aphorisms on Bhakti. Bhakti means, you know, devotion to God. Devotion to God is what is called Bhakti and Narada defines what is divine and then what should be the devotion, what is the ideal devotion. He was a great Bhakta. Narada's story comes in Mahabhagavatam also, in Srimad Bhagavatam. In the very first few chapters, you find uh, the story of Narada. And Narada is a character who is ubiquitous, you can say. 
he is seen everywhere in every text and wherever somebody is in some problem wherever somebody needs some sort of moral or ethical guidance this gentleman is there suddenly appearing and giving some guidance to him so he is that nature that person so that is why it is called, he is a person narada the meaning of narada is naram means gnanam naram naram dadati iti narada like varada you know the meaning of varada varada means varam is a boon varada is a god who gives some boons is called varada so narada is naram dadati that is a person who gives gnanam a person who dispels our ajnana and then imparts wisdom so a person who the, the, that is the meaning of narada and so this first shloka is about the uh, the way in which narada um, uh, i mean valmiki asks a question puts a question to valmiki uh, sorry narada let us read this first shloka only this first shloka we will read together thereafter i will read the shlokas myself Uh, the only first chapter i will read as i said i will not read out all the chapters because 20 to 4000 shlokas we cannot read only the first chapter i will read and out of that too the first shloka we will read together tapasvadhyaya niratam tapasvadhyaya niratam tapasvi vagvidam varam tapasvi vagvidam varam naradam paripapracha naradam paripapracha valmikir munipungavam valmikir munipungavam so this is the first shloka so in fact in olden days the tradition is that if a teacher teaches this shloka to the student that is supposed to be a sort of initiation so technically you are initiated into reading ramayana anyway so anyway the traditional teachers they talk about this uh, say shloka for hours and hours if you just go to a traditional scholar who has studied all the commentaries on ramayana there are several commentaries as i said i am reading only two commentaries that is one by govinda raja and another by maheshwara tirtha one is in the vishishta advaita tradition and one is in the advaita tradition then anyway there there will not be much difference because the story of rama somebody says oh he is uh, advaita tradition they, their approach is slightly different vishishta advaita tradition they say vishnu is supreme and uh, rama is the avatar of vishnu etc etc so but these uh, traditional scholars if you see this shloka they explain for hours and hours because each word is so loaded with meaning rama this uh, in fact any great poet he introduces you introduces the subject in such a way that uh, the very first step is like uh, the very first shloka or the very first uh, say verse is so uh, deep in meaning there is so much of uh, there are so many connotations for each and every word so let us see i will not tell for hours i will tell only for maybe about for 15 20 minutes or half an hour because this entire reading of ramayana may go on for a few months or maybe even for an year and this is for somebody who really wants to know what is there in ramayana so this tapasvadhyaya niratam tapasvi vagvidam varam aradam paripapracha valmikir munipungavam in this particular shloka the line, the line is valmikihi naradam paripapracha that is valmiki asked narada that is the line and in that there are three adjectives for narayana uh, sorry narada there are three adjectives for narada what is that number one is he is a tapasvadhyaya nirata that is a person who is always dedicated to tapas and swadhyaya he is always so firm in tapas and swadhyaya and what is this tapas and swadhyaya in fact tapas is a very very important word in our tradition if you see bhagavad gita in the 17th chapter of gita there are six verses which are devoted to what is tapas there are six verses tapas actually the meaning there are two meanings for that word tapas one is tapa alochane thinking think 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 that that is the one meaning and the other meaning is tapa means to heat up make it make something hot we heat up something so this tapa is a significant word because that is supposed to be the first word heard by the creator brahma himself in the vaishnava tradition it seems this brahma the creator brahma originates from uh, say um, the navel of uh, say lord vishnu there is a there is a lotus in that lotus he he appears 
and there he is just looking around he doesn't know what to do and then he is just thinking about how to how to create he is supposed to be the creator he was just contemplating on how to do he was just thinking about what to do then when he was in a dilemma or rather he was just uh, say having no guidance from anybody then he heard some uh, voice akashavani as we call it he heard some voice it may be an internal voice or an external voice we do not know but he heard a voice tapa 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 means tapasva you do meditate 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 contemplate contemplate so if you want to do anything in a right way you have to contemplate on that so that contemplation is something which is a very very important term in our tradition so the in fact if you go to in you know, upanishad you see the, all this as i said meaning of vedas through the text to the common man means this only by using these words in such a way that he is conveying what is told some comp- some concepts in the vedic text to the common man so tapa is uh, say as i said it has got there are six verses in bhagavad gita the first uh, say the, the the three verses they talk about uh, say the tapas in terms of the body tapas in terms of the mind tapas in terms of the speech so we, so we, we know that any human being interacting with the society three things come into picture number one is our mind what is there in our mind that that is one the first thing then the second thing is what we speak is another thing then the third is what we do is another thing so manasa manasa manasik manasa vachika that is voice and kaika kaika means the body so this tapas relating to the mind tapas relating to austerity or um, say is a sort of um, self purification which is associated with the mind purification which is associated pure purity rather purity associated with the speech and purity associated with our action so these three things are told in bhagavad gita 17 chapter this 14th to 16th shlokas 14 15 and 16 they talk about this kaika vachika manasa tapas so manasa is something Um, the purity of mind you are whether you are doing something entertaining some ele- element of enmity or hatred to somebody or are you doing a thing with a pure mind so a person is supposed to do a thing with a pure mind tapaswadhyaya narata is somebody who is a, a person who is in this tapas the purity is the parameter purity is the parameter on which this tapas has to be judged then word the words have to be pure we are not they should the word should be inoffensive so that is what is character what characterizes you one has to speak truth so that is what is what is what is called vangmayam tapah vangmayam is related to words then kaika tapas is purity in action ahimsa we are not supposed to uh, say cause any harm to people doing the right action 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 only so that is the bodily tapas and also respecting elders etc deva dvija guru pragnya poojanam etc etc say lord krishna says then tapas in terms of shraddha also is there devotion whether you are doing it in a very sincere conscientious manner or whether you are doing that tapas in a hypocritical manner there are people who are hypocrites who do some tapas and then they expect people to come around them and they come uh, sit around them and then they will see oh what a great sage he is he is a very great tapas great tapasvi and then people will praise you and you are always aware of how the other people think of you so you are doing that tapas so that you will get some praise you will be adored by them people will come and touch your feet people in turn they will also give some money to you so there are several people who do this in order to win the not only the minds and hearts of the people but also the minds hearts and purses of the people so that is what that is what is that is a hypocritical tapas so that tapas in terms of shraddha also is is told in bhagavad gita in three shlokas and there is what is called rakshasa tapas because ravana the villain in this epic ravana who abducts sita he is also a great tapasvi he also does very very great tapas but his tapas is to- totally in the opposite direction his tapas hard work can be in the good 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 direction or hard work can be in the bad direction so tapas without leaving out this purity and all that you do in a totally different direction so that is somewhat like producing some atom bombs and pro- dropping on people 
So Ravana does that Rakshasa Tapas. So that is the reason why this Tapas is a very, very important word. So he, ta- he starts with this Tapas. And then Tapas also refers to Brahma. Tapo Brahmeti, that is what Taitri Upanishad says. So tapa, what is that? Tapasa Brahma Vijigna Saswa Tapo Brahmeti. It says Tapa is called Brahma. That is contemplation, rightly. With the purity of mind, that itself is the Brahma. So commentators have said that by using this word Tapas, uh, Valmiki has really done the Devata Smarana. In the beginning, we are supposed to pray to a god or goddess, isn't it? So the Devata Smaranam, what, what better thing is there than that ultimate reality called Brahman? So by using this word Tapas, Valmiki has referred to the greatest reality called Brahma and done, done this Devata Smaranam. So that is how commentators say, we will continue in the next class. Harihi Om Tatsatu.